Besides those that are announced that are sick, we have some out of town and others that are not doing too well. We're grateful for your presence. <coughs> Hopefully we'll, those that are absent will be back with us before too long. You might open your Bibles to the New Testament, to Romans chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. We'll look at it in a moment. Romans 4, verses 3 through 7. In this particular sermon, we're going to study what the Bible teaches concerning how men guilty of sin, men who transgress God's law, 1 John 3, 4, can become righteous. God's a just God, perfectly just. How does a just God not punish all sinners? But without the knowledge of the New Testament on how God could do that and remain a just God, you won't know. And as we begin our study, all of us need to understand that it's impossible for those who are guilty of sin to become righteous by their own individual volition or power or the collective power of any number of other mere human beings or for that matter, angels. It's only by God's infallible plan is it possible for sinful man to be accounted as righteous before God. And that leads us then to Paul's comments in the passage I gave you, Romans 4, 3 through 7. So let's read that together, if you would, please. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. When I've read that passage, I've always got to this point and said, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Who is that man? I want to be him. But there's a process. And a lot of folks don't know the New Testament teaching concerning that process. I want us to look at this verse a little further, these verses. And we zero in on the word righteous. Fundamentally, fundamentally, the word righteous means simply to be correct. To be correct. So the word righteousness is the state of having been found correct. Usually we only hear the word used today when one really is labeling another person to be self-righteous. And the sneer on one's lips as you say, well, you're self-righteous. And usually we mean by that arrogant or something like that. But righteous is a good word. Righteousness, of course, as I said, has to do with the state of having been found correct. But today it's used almost in a religious context. It might be nice to know just where it came from. It was originally used to describe one's correctness in relationship to another person. A person acquitted of being charged with a crime was said to be righteous. And in legal parlance today, when you read, you'll still see they use that terminology. Furthermore, in acting toward one's fellow man, if one did good deeds one was said to be 
righteous. And the problem really comes in here when it comes to describing someone's relationship with God. Now we're back to what I mentioned early on. How is it possible for one who has sinned against God and all have, Romans 3, 23, and the wages of sin is death, separation from God, Romans 6, 23. How is it possible for a person like that to become reconciled to a perfectly and flawlessly just God? Being just means you must be punished when you sin. So how can God remain just and not punish you for your sins? Well, somebody's got to be able to become righteous or right in actions before God. There must be a way that happens. So again, I say, how can a just God provide for sinful human beings to be acquitted of sin and God remain perfectly just? That's uh, the mystery when you see that meaning unrevealed that the New Testament does reveal. That's the reason that people who had only had the Old Testament didn't understand how that's going to happen. It helps you appreciate more and more the Ethiopian nobleman whom Philip approached when he's reading in Isaiah 53, which is a prophecy written some 750 years before Christ walked this earth, concerning the death of Christ and how God would be satisfied with his death. And so what does the Ethiopian eunuch say to Philip after he asks him, understand what you read? And the man said, how can I except some man should guide me? He had no New Testament as we do to see all of that unfolded. So preachers of the past and ought to still be today used to say the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So to understand all those prophecies about the Christ when down through the centuries God unfolded them, we have to have the New Testament. You have to have the Gospel of Christ. It's obvious from this study here that by own merit we cannot be acquitted by God as far as our sins are concerned. That is, we can't be made righteous, made correct. Furthermore, one cannot by one's own meritorious actions have any good deeds one does be accounted righteous before God. Now, if you go back to verses 4 through, or 3 through 6 in chapter 4, which we read, you'll see that this is Paul's basic point. So the question I raise now is why must our acts be counted for righteousness? Our conduct, why must our conduct, our actions that make up that conduct, why must it be accounted for righteousness? In other words, why can't man just be righteous? Why can't he just be right? There's a simple answer to that. Because we have sinned. All is sin and comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And as James points out, when you violate one part of God's law, the whole of law condemns you. And we stand condemned before God because we've sinned. The idea being one sin negates all righteous deeds that would have otherwise proven us righteous. I don't think a lot of people understand that. They think you've got to renounce everything there is about the teachings of Christ concerning how we ought to conduct our lives before, maybe even reach a stage of atheism, before God is going to reject us. Not so. I think a good example of that is the Apostle Peter himself. Peter did not totally apostatize from the faith. He committed one sin, and Paul was stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Listen to what he said in Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3. David, it's a psalm of David. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now notice how he describes humanity. They are corrupt. 
They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They're all gone aside. They're all together become filthy. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. If you go later into the book, Psalm 143, verse 2 reads, And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight no man living is righteous. And then we come to the New Testament in chapter 3 of the book of Romans, in verse 10, which echoes the sentiments of Psalm 143, 2. And Paul writes, There is none that is righteous, no not one. Now, what do we say about the meaning of the word righteous? There is none that is correct. No, not one. There is no righteousness of a person. That is, no man is found to be correct. Why? It's because of our sin. Because of our sin, man cannot intrinsically be righteous. However, there are circumstances where a person's actions may be counted for righteousness. Now, the word in the King James is impute. It's in other English translations, account. And in the Greek, it's the countenance term that was used. So let's, let's note what does not get counted for righteousness, what's not counted for righteousness. Right deeds that we do thinking, thinking that these deeds will merit our salvation. That's cleared up again in Romans 4, 3 through 6. That's the very point, the reason I chose that verse that I started with. I can think this is all right. I think it's acceptable. I can think this makes me correct in the eyes of God. But my think so doesn't prove anything other than this. That's what I thought. But look with me over to the ninth chapter of Romans. The ninth chapter of Romans, verses 30 and 33. 30 through 33. Paul says, notice how he reasons with the church at Rome. as they read. They think of this letter being read, and it's like he's preaching this sermon to them, and he's asking them to think with him. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, all non-Jews, which followed not after righteousness, there's our word, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained unto the law of righteousness. Wherefore, in other words, why is that the case? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, which is simply saying by a pure law system, we can't get it because we sin. Notice concerning the Jews, he continues to say, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. He goes ahead to point out, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Where is he directing everybody to, Jew and Gentile alike? Jesus Christ. And we sing a song sometimes, whether we get the message of it, I don't know, but it's based upon the truth. Jesus paid it all. He's the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. So John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Christ, announced. It's not by any meritorious acts which we have done. Meritorious act is this. You work for me four hours, I pay you $5 an hour, you get the results. Why? Because you work for me. That's not the way salvation is offered through Christ, by the gospel to mankind. So because of sin, man cannot intrinsically be righteous. He just can't. And we see then that just merely thinking that our actions, our deeds, 
will merit our salvation won't get it. Also contrived systems of salvation that God is not authorized. You know, we're taught, as the scripture above my head says in Colossians 3.17, Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. That lets us know very quickly whatever we do must be authorized by our Savior, by our King. What, what good does it do to call him a sovereign king whose word is law and not follow his word? In Matthew 15, 9, he plainly said in his earthly ministry, Jesus that is, but in vain they do worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. If you go back over to Romans 10, look at what Paul says to the church at Rome concerning such matters, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 10. Brethren, he's speaking about Israel. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, God's righteousness, God's standard of right doing. Now, those of you in the class this morning, remember I said, yeah, I said some things in class, introduced this lesson. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, their own system of right doing. What did that, ha what what did that cause them to do? Well, they haven't submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. There is a righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, for right doing, for right living, to everyone that believeth. You have that same idea discussed by Paul to the church in Philippi in chapter 3 in verse 6, beginning. Chapter 3, verse 6. I'll start reading go through verse 10. Paul says to them, Concerning himself, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win <clears throat> Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. In other words, you can't find God's righteousness in the law of Moses. Of course, some people say, well, then what was the use of the law of Moses? Well, Galatians alone helps tell you that. And so does the book of Hebrews. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now, it's important to understand many times the article, the, does not appear before faith, such as contend for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints, Jude 3. But many times it means the system of salvation that is the gospel system, the New Testament system. It simply comes down to this, how am I made righteous before God today, seeing that none of the other things will make me righteous how is it that my acts are righteous today? Because of the system of faith that is the New Testament system. It's that simple. If you look at Philippians 3 and verse 9, you'll see again, and he found in him not having my, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith. Notice there it is, the faith. That means the New Testament system of faith the righteousness which is of God by faith. I wish we understood in the study of the scriptures the importance what grammarians call a synecdoche, where a part stands for the whole of a thing or a whole for a part. When Jude says contend for the faith once for all delivered the saints, 
He uses one of the most fundamental parts of how a person is saved from his sins. That is his faith, his confidence, his trust, his belief in God and Christ and the gospel system. And he pulls it out and lets it stand for the whole New Testament system. So when Jude says contend for the faith once for all to the saints, he's saying contend for the whole of the New Testament system and any component part of it. That's what he's saying. And thus when you see that we are made righteous by the faith that he's talking about. God extends the way of salvation to men through the system of faith that is the New Testament system. Well, then no wonder Paul establishes as his theme in starting the book of Romans that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God and salvation. That's the way that man becomes righteous. That's where your doings are righteous. Not any meritorious actions on your part, but involving actions. But what actions? Actions of righteousness. But who's, who's righteousness? People don't seem to understand that when you from the heart obey the truth of the New Testament, you're not doing what you want to do. You're not doing what any group of men have saddled upon you. You're doing the Lord's will. When the church does the Lord's work, it's doing what the New Testament said. Whose New Testament? Jesus' New Testament. When I obey Him, His work is done. Not my own work or any uh, works of my brethren. In reality, when a person becomes a Christian, it's a passive thing. You're submitting to the Lord's will. Involves your actions. Well, what kind of actions are they? Submission to the Lord's will. Submission to prove what? That you have faith in Christ according to the gospel that he will save you when you from the heart obey that form of doctrine, Romans 6, 17 and 18. Do you realize that when you're baptized, that's Christ baptizing you? Well, no, Brother So-and-So baptized me. Well, Brother So-and-So may have taught you the Bible. Sister So-and-So may have taught you this. Your parents may have raised you. But what did they teach you? Their will or the will of Jesus Christ? And when you understood the will of Jesus Christ properly and you obeyed the will of Christ, who are you obeying? Why, you confess Christ to be the Son of God. You confess Him as Savior. And thus, really, when you have someone baptize you into Christ, it's a passive thing on your part. You're submitting to the will of Christ. So who, who was it that baptized you? Same one that added you to His church. Now, who was that? It was Jesus. How did He do it? You submitted to Him. Thus, I'm a product of the work of Jesus Christ. And so is every other child of God a product of the work of Christ. We, Paul says in the Ephesians, are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I don't think people understand that. They just see it from the standpoint of me obeying something. But it is something, but it's the Lord's will. I obey him. When I obey the Lord's will, his work's done. Thus, we need to understand about these, these matters. Now, let me develop this even further. Here are some examples of righteousness concerning how a person who's a sinner, actions can be counted for Righteousness. And it was taught a long time ago back in the patriarchal age of the Old Testament. Genesis 6 and verse number 9 tells us that Noah was a righteous man. Now think about the meaning of righteousness. Noah was a righteous man. And yet in verse 8, the Bible says Noah found grace in God's sight. He found favor in God's sight. So Noah being righteous did not preclude God's grace. In Genesis 6 and verse 18, 
You see, there was a covenant made between God and Noah concerning how he'd be saved from the flood. So Noah's righteousness did not preclude God's covenant. And lo and behold, we come to the end of chapter 6. Genesis 6 and verse 22. And here's what is said by Moses who recorded this for inspiration. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Therefore, Noah's righteous did not preclude God's commandment. Notice, it did not preclude God's grace. It did not preclude God's covenant. And it did not preclude God's commandment. Genesis 7, verse 1, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come down all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. His actions were right. And God favored him and gave him a plan. Now whose plan was it and where did it originate concerning the ark for Noah to be saved by the flood? God. But it involved man believing God with such a belief that he carried out the plan God gave him. Now when, when Noah was looking for that gopher wood, when he designed the ark according to the design God revealed to him, one window and one door and all these things, Whose work really made the ark? God built the ark. Just because he used Noah and his sons to build it didn't mean it wasn't God's ark. Certainly wasn't man's ark. Man never heard of the rain at that time, much less a flood of such stature. And so Noah, as is said in Hebrews 11 and 7, by faith Noah being warned of God of concerning things not seen as yet. They'd never seen such a thing. Notice, moved with godly fear. Move means action on my part and on his part. Notice, moved with godly fear. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Did Noah have anything to do with the salvation of his house? The Holy Spirit through the rite of Hebrews said he did. And it says, through which he condemned the world. Now listen. And became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. Did Noah hear the word of God? Yeah, for his day he did. Concerning what? How he's going to be able to be delivered from the flood. God favored him. God made a covenant with him. It involved Noah having faith in God based upon the word of God. For faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And it involved Noah building the ark. But whose ark was it? If you had said, Noah, why are you using gopher wood? Well, God told me to. Why are you putting only one door in that ark? God told me to. Why one window? God told me to. Whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Give me thanks to God the Father through him. But we move down further. Look at all this being established way back there in the patriarchal age. A principle that follows right upon through how man's made righteous today through Christ by the gospel. Take Abraham. Genesis 15, 1 through 6. What does God do? Well, God promised Abraham seed of his own loins. We won't go back and read all of that now. Genesis 15, 1 through 6. But Paul says over in the New Testament as an example of how one is saved by faith in Romans 4, 1 through 8, it was when Abraham believed God. God put it down. God imputed it. God accounted it for righteousness. Then James in the New Testament, chapter 2, 21 through 24, refers to Abraham again. Abraham's righteousness was fulfilled when he offered Isaac. Abraham, why do you offer Isaac? And as God said to him, thy son, thine only son, the son whom thou lovest. Why did you do that? In other places, God condemned men severely for offering their children as burnt offerings. But he told Abraham to do that. That's the only reason it was right. Right. Notice there's our word. Right. Righteousness. Right doing. Why was it right doing for him to offer Isaac? God told him to. 
Abraham's faith became righteousness. And Abraham obeyed God's commands and offered up Isaac. Now ask yourself the question, why is that in the Old Testament for you to read in view of Paul's statement in Romans 15, 4, whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now, there are certain misconceptions concerning the doctrine of righteousness that govern the denomination or in particular, and maybe even some of our own brethren. Man cannot in and of himself alone perform a righteous act. We've already touched on that some. Romans 3.10, there's none that is righteous, no, not one. Man cannot on his own be righteous before God. But when man acts upon faith and obedience to God's word, he acts righteously. That's right doing. He takes God at his word. Since faith comes by hearing the word of God, then his faith is in God based upon the revelation of God's word that tells him the righteous acts he's to do. They're God's acts we do. God accounts such actions as righteous, not out of any merit within a person, or act on his doing, but simply because Jesus Christ, Son of God and Savior of the world, has authorized such acts to be righteous within his covenant. That's the very point made when you go back to Romans chapter 6, where Paul's writing. And look at verses 17 through 19. I've alluded to part of this already. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, that you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, he became the servants of righteousness. Then note verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity and to iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. Well, what's righteous? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth the Jew first also the Greek. And Jesus, in giving the great commission, is marked, recorded, it is go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why? Well, Paul told us, didn't he? It's the power of God to save men from sin. It's the righteousness of God. If man will become righteous, he can't do so apart from the gospel system. And thus you have the scriptures such as 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, as to the importance of it. Any work that man does regarding his salvation is a work of merit and cannot be counted for righteousness. That's as false as it can be. It does not recognize but one kind of work, a meritorious work, and the whole denominational world is caught up in that, and it's just as false as it can be. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, not by works done in righteousness, which we did ourselves, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Well, isn't that a contradiction what we've been saying? No, he's telling Titus, this young preacher, that if you try to establish your righteousness on the basis of man-made doctrines or your own think so, it's not going to work. That's why James says, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. That word teaches us things to believe and do. So this passage, Titus 3, 5, doesn't teach that every work that man does is a work that can't be righteous. It just tells you the kind of works that are not righteous. When we put trust in our own works, we create works to substitute for Christ's will, then we have created our own righteousness. And God doesn't accept that. Somebody stands up and says, all you have to do to be saved is just ask Christ to come into your heart and believe in him. Well, that's a work of man's righteousness. And the very ones who teach that are trying to say, oh, we trust completely in God's righteousness. Well, then, why don't you teach the whole gospel? The gospel of Christ that teaches the importance of belief in Christ and how it's formed also teaches repentance, confession of faith in Christ, and baptism into Christ for the remission of sins. When we put our faith, trust, and obedience in Christ, I say again as I said earlier, they are Christ's works of righteousness which we have done and not our own. Hebrews 10, 38, 
But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrink back, my soul hath no pleasure in him. Hebrews 11, verse 4, that great chapter on faith. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. 1 John 3, 7, the apostle John wrote to Christians, He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Now, 1 John 3, 7 must be in harmony with Titus 3, 5. So it's obvious the righteousness of which Titus, uh, Paul talked to Titus about is a righteousness of man's conjuring up. But what John says is the righteousness of Christ. Then there's the doctrine of imputed or transferred righteousness. And this doctrine states that man can never do a righteous deed because of his sin. So God must look upon Christ's own personal righteousness in substitution of man. The doctrine, this particular doctrine, doesn't take into account this fact that Christ's righteousness is not sinful and not a sinful person's own personal righteousness, but the system of salvation that Christ brought for man with his own blood. And again, that righteousness that is acceptable to God is that which is found in the gospel. You see, the doctrine of imputed righteousness said Christ lived a perfect life. I'm a sinner, I can't. So they take the perfected life of Christ and they put it on the person who's a sinner. And thus, when God sees man, he just sees the life of Christ. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the Lord has a will that saves man and puts our faith in Christ that he did die for us, that he shed his blood for the remission of our sins. And thus we in faith, faith comes by hearing the word of God, obey him, and that's the gospel system. When man acts in faith and obedience to Christ's testament or covenant, God accounts that act for righteousness. Why? Because a person's trusting in Christ's covenant to be saved. When a person truly obeys the gospel, he's trusting in Christ through his covenant to save him. Hebrews 6, 9, notice again, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 9. So we conclude the lesson. We studied the, right, the doctrine of righteousness, of right doing, of being right before God. We've seen how that when we by faith obey the gospel, that's counted in God's mind for righteousness in our lives. We've seen examples of it from the Old Testament in Noah and Abraham. And then we examine some false doctrine on righteousness. So don't be led astray from the truth regarding righteousness by all kinds of denominational errors on this or any other subject. And I'll leave you with this one verse. It's quite plain. John writing to Christians in 1 John 3, 7. My little children, let no man lead you astray. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. When I from the heart obey the gospel of Christ and live as the New Testament teaches, God accounts that for righteousness on my part. I have nothing to glory in. I am still a person who is imperfect. But I take God in his word and I follow it wherever he teaches me to follow it. And God says, I count that to you for righteousness. Because you're faithful to my son's will. If you need to obey the gospel, we hope you'll do it this morning. We studied what to do to become a Christian. And as a child of God, if you've wandered from the faith, committed sin, we urge you to repent of those sins and pray God for forgiveness is God's second law of pardon for the child of God. So we urge you to think about these things and realize we must stand before God righteous as heaven to be our home. And thus our actions must be accounted righteous to God. And what actions are they? He's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come when we stand and sing.